getting it started. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dave Edwards. I'm the Monitoring and Research Director here at Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. Uh, this is a big project that I'll be talking about today. A lot of moving parts and a lot of people have come and gone throughout the project. So I'm excited to talk about some of the preliminary results that we've, that we've found over the years. As you can see, it's a project about an invasive mussel that's kind of taking a hold in all of our Great Lakes area. And all down at the bottom here, you see a few of the players that were involved in the project. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Maybe. There we go. So for those of you maybe not so familiar with us and those of you watching remotely, uh, we are the Watershed Council. We do a lot of watershed management projects. We engage in a lot of monitoring and surveying every year. We do a lot of restoration projects, whether that be shoreline restoration or road stream crossings. We engage with policy and advocacy, so any of the policy down in Lansing or other areas that in the Great Lakes that we feel we need to comment on, we'll provide some feed feedback on those. And then of course we do a lot of education and outreach with our education programs and events such as this today. Here's our watershed areas that we cover. So. Well, today we'll be talking about Brown Lake, which is right in the Sheboygan River watershed. But we also service as far south towards Traverse City and the Kalkaska County, Sheboygan, I'm sorry, Charlevoix, and uh, Little Traverse Bay watershed. It's quite the area that we cover, and it's a lot of fun. What I'd like to do is just start off by giving a quick synopsis of the program and talk about a video that was created for this project. We have despoiled our Great Lakes for many generations. We have extracted wealth from the Great Lakes and left a legacy of either contamination or loss of habitat or invasive species in this case. And we are slowly but inexorably trying to turn that back and put the pieces back together that manifest what we have heard across the state from, at least in Michigan, 9.8 million people on what they see the future of the Great Lakes to be. The Little River Band of Ottawa Indians is right on the shores of Lake Michigan. And thankfully, my forefathers, our forefathers, when they were thinking about what they wanted to protect, it was the water resources. Zebra and quagga mussels were first discovered in Lake St. Clair in 1986. And in just three years, by 1989, they were present in all five of the Great Lakes. In the ecosystems, the mussels filter a large quantity of the water, which impacts the algae that tends to grow in the water body. The mussels can selectively feed on the native beneficial algae while selectively rejecting and thus allowing the negative microcystis and blue-green algae to become more prolific. This application method here in Round Lake is somewhat new. So this project will investigate many aspects of using Zequinox to control invasive mussels within the lake ecosystem. Thousand microorganisms were, were isolated and tested and one showed activity against the Dracaenid mussels. A remarkable discovery and that's the way nature is. Quite remarkable of being able to find something that's sitting there in nature that just is that selective against the Dracaenid mussels and doesn't harm anything else. This project is interesting because it's a collaborative effort between state, federal, and universities and private sector groups all coming together to try and expand research to control zebra mussels. For the application to be successful, we're hoping to find that we're not really seeing a change in the pattern of emergence with insects. rewarding to see all of this come together. A lot of very talented individuals and a lot of really great organizations putting resources into this problem. And it's just been an absolutely great experience functioning as, as the, the hub bringing all of this together on this specific project. So that was a nice little promotional video put together, but it provides a nice overview of the project and what we were trying to accomplish. Kind of sets the stage a little bit. 
Uh, the two muscles that we were looking at in round wake was the zebra muscle here on the left and the quagga muscle here on the right. And you can see the differences. Zebra muscles are a little bit darker in coloration. They have a little bit more striations on their body. And uh, quagga muscles are a little bit rounder in shape. In terms of the life cycle, so what I'm going to talk about here in general is zebra muscles and quagga muscles, where they came from, their general biology, the ecology of them, um, and then we'll get into the actual project of what we did and some of the, the preliminary results at the end. These are, muscles are both planktonic and benthic, meaning that they live within the water column and at the bottom of the lake. They have a fairly uh, expansive life cycle where they go through these different life stages and different sizes, um, and as they release eggs into the water column, they develop and they are what's called villagers. So these tiny little, we call them babies essentially, zebra mussels that are floating in the water column and they are at the mercy, if you will, of the movement of the water. As they grow in, in size and they become larger, they can then settle out to wherever they end up. They spread very easily, as I mentioned, and they can colonize very, very quickly. So here's an example of a native mussel down the bottom just covered in tiny, tiny, small zebra mussels where they've settled. Um, they have these, these threads coming out of the bottom that are called bissel threads, and they secrete this glue that allows them to attach to all the hard substrates in their area. So wherever they settle out, they can basically find a hard substrate, attach themselves to it, and they're glued to that until they're removed. Um, so as the video mentioned, they were native to the Black and Caspian Seas. They were documented throughout Europe by the mid-1800s. They made our way in the Great Lakes around 1980s, and they came over in ballast water in the Great Lakes. And just to show this a little bit, and what I'd like you to do is pay attention to where they end up in some of the lakes of our area, and when. So I'll start in 86. Over in the Alpena area around 1990, and then by the early 90s and mid 90s, they're in our neck of the woods. For quagga mussels, here's where they kind of proliferated in, in Lake Michigan. Around 1995, we saw very, very few. Within five years, up in the northern area of Michigan, we saw 10 times 10 density size. Then by five years later, we're talking 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 <laughs> population size per <coughs> meter squared, which is a, a massive amount of mussels in that short amount of time. So why is all this important? Well, they essentially are replacing the native mussels in this food chain or food web. And you may have heard some cases in lakes nearby or issues of fishing and not seeing a large perch population, not seeing as many walleye in recent years. A lot of that has to do with this pushing out of the native mussels and the zebra mussels coming in, which eat the phytoplankton, which feed the zooplankton, which then feed the smaller fish, and of course the smaller walleye also feed on the zooplankton. So if you're adding a, an organism that's replacing something that did not filter as often or as fast, you're totally messing with this connection and you're reducing food available for the fish that we also like to consume. So there's a lot of con connections that uh, are kind of sometimes glossed over or forgotten about. Just while the water's clear, that's because the zebra mussels are there, but it's also filtering out all the food that other fish and organisms like to enjoy. Case in point, one zebra mussel can filter about one liter of water per day. So if you consider 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 muscles in one meter square, it's a lot of water being filtered out in one, one day. And this has been shown in not just our volunteer programs, but also our comprehensive program that we do every three years. So the volunteers in all of our lakes go out to collect secchi disc depth, so how clear the water is. Uh, they take a sample to measure chlorophyll A, which is the measurement of algae in the water column. 
water temperature and also to dissolve oxygen. Our comprehensive program is connected through chlorophyll A with our total phosphorus measurements. And then um, some of the dissolved oxygen and pH could also be influenced by, by zebra mussels. So here's an example of some of the data that our volunteers have collected and our, our comprehensive <laughs> program has collected. This is a chart of phosphorus levels in Lake Charlevoix over the last, since 1987, over the last 30 some years. And what you'll notice, and as we saw in that image earlier that showed the infestation process or timeline, early 1990s and mid 1990s, mussels came in, invaded, filtered out all of the chlorophyll and the algae that were containing the phosphorus. So you see a dramatic decline as they came in and infested that lake. Similarly with the secchi disc, you would imagine if you're reducing the chlorophyll, things that are in the water column, then you can see further down into the lake. And that's what this graph is showing. If as you lower the secchi disc into the water, you get a deeper depth because you can see further down into the water. So again, same time frame, early 1990s, mid 1990s, there were some dramatic lows hit and they're still present in that lake. So the deep decline has, has a, or I'm sorry, the water clarity has continued to increase. Lastly, another example for just chlorophyll A, which is from Mullet Lake this time. Early to mid 1990s, early 2000s, they were a little later in this, in the, on that map during the infestation. But the zebra mussels are again filtering out the chlorophyll in that lake. An indirect Im impact of these zebra mussels, so something else that they're influencing, not directly, but as these zebra mussels are filtering out the water. Light is, be, is able to reach further down into the water. More algae is able to grow on the bottom because that sunlight is penetrating deeper into the water. Well, that area at the bottom can only hold so much algae and so much growth. As that capacity is, is reached and, and overextended, those algae and plants begin to die. Um, that again then feeds more growth because you're releasing more nutrients so it's a kind of a feedback loop as they go. Gobies will also eat zebra mussels and so they're also kind of they're also concentrating this what's called a uh, avian botulism toxin in their bodies. So as those fish are consuming that toxin the birds will then consume <coughs> the fish which then can lead to bird deaths on the shoreline as we walk and see sometimes. And just lastly, a couple of uh, other impacts. Dragon, uh, zebra mussels can colonize on dragonfly nymphs as they try to emerge and they end up dying. Humans, we can cut our feet as we walk into the lake. Um, and then here's what we're talking about today is this indirect impact of zebra mussels colonizing these native mussels, preventing them from opening their shell or moving along the bottom of, this, of, the, of the lakes. And there's an example of one of our record breakers, you could say, of the project that had 45 or 50 zebra mussels attached to it at one time. All alive, all filtering out, fine. Of course, the native mussel was suffering. So, a solution emerges for all of this. Here's a little timeline. Dequinox, or the, the bacteria Pseudomonas fluorescens, was identified by the New York State Museum in the mid-1990s. And it was identified as the one strain of bacteria that selectively killed these Dracenid mussels. After more than 700 strains of bacteria were tested, this was the one that stood out. At that time, a patent was issued for the bacteria and it was licensed to uh, Marone Bio Innovations based out of uh, California. In 2011, Zequinox was registered with the Environmental Protection Agency. And at the same time, multiple field trials were being conduct conducted in uh, power plants and other industri industries across the country. The zebra mussels come in, they like to colonize that hard piping system substrates and Zequinox was a solution for those industrial and power plant uh, problems. In 2012 then it was approved by the EPA for those, for those closed systems after the, the facilities uh, were shown to be effective at removing zebra mussels. From there it was expanded to environmental restoration, which is what our project is about. 
That was in 2014. 2016, the first group of studies using Zequinox in a natural environment occurred in Minnesota, early 2016. And then from there, our project took, us, took it a step further and did not use any sort of enclosures and it was the first open water uh, application in a lake system. So in Minnesota, they had these barriers set up around the lake and it, they were semi-permeable, so they allowed water to pass through, but tended to concentrate the Zequinox at wh wherever it was applied. Quickly about the bacteria, it's, it's commonly found in soil, often in a relationship with plant roots. Uh, this strain of bacteria was, was grown, dried, and, and powdered right here in Michigan. And the cell wall is living or not, although Zequinox itself is, is, is dead, does interfere with the muscle metabolism. So this is how it actually kills the muscles. As it's ingested, it, it hemorrhages the digestive gland of these muscles. So it comes into them and uh, the muscles, their digestive tract essentially deteriorates or um, lyses and breaks down. So here's what these two images are showing. On the left, you see a healthy muscle. And you can see these large circles of this band. And then in the middle here are these, these tubules of, of the muscle cell. This band is the di digestive tract that's being deteriorated over there. So the, on the right hand side, there's a little redder in coloration due to the presence of blood cells and blood vessels from that deterioration. Yeah. You said that it was a selective killer of those two muscles. Yeah. And I know that we have very few native muscles left, okay, but would, would it have the same effect on other filter feeders like, like the native muscles? So far, all of those tests have shown negative for, for native muscles. Yeah. Um, all of the tests so far have been selective towards these Dracaena muscles. And they've done everything from uh, juvenile and adult native muscles. Um, they've done no mortality or any impact to fathead minnows, brown trout, bluegills, crayfish, uh, midge. So yeah, it's been very selective so far. Mm -hmm. And these are in lab, lab conditions, but also during natural uh, experiments in Minnesota, they showed something similar. Yes, did you have a question? Is this uh, pellets or what? It's actually a dried powder. So it's kind of like a talc powder if you were to mix it with water, and that's how you could imagine it. So, so how, did, how did they just put that in a, in a designated area if it was just a powder? Well, they mixed it with lake water okay. to a certain concentration and then put it wherever they wanted to test the impact or the effectiveness. Okay. So, so far, all the selective tests have gone towards these two species of mussels. You have quagga and brown lake? We only looked at zebra actually. So okay. quagga is, I, yeah. I haven't seen quagga. Yeah. But the uh, studies also point towards uh, a safe usage of it. So not just does it impact non-target organisms, are there other organisms, but it's also safe for, for us to be around. It's so far has been shown to be suitable with contact for food and, and some drinking water. Um, we can come in contact with it through recreational swimming. And this, a few studies, and here's an example, show that it does tend to degrade within 24 hours. And you might expect that because it's such a fine piece of material and it's a bacteria that's na naturally found in soil. And that's what soil organisms tend to do is break down stuff. And it is an organic material, very, very small organic material that will, can break down easily. So here's a couple images of some studies using those barriers that I mentioned. They sectioned off parts of a lake. And you, what you can kind of make out here is a, a flap coming down into the lake. So that allows water to, to go through, but tends to keep the chemical or the Zequinox concentrated in that, in that area. That was a Minnesota study, huh? It was, yes. So, and these studies showed a lot of promise as they were able to decrease the number of, of zebra mussels within those barriers. That gave the idea of what we're doing. So here's Round Lake, our, our study system. 
The red line you can see is the watershed for this lake, so any water that's in this red area will eventually end up in Round Lake. We had a number of questions that we wanted to answer with this type of study. So under these natural water Round Lake conditions, under open water conditions, first of all, do native unionids, native mussels, respond to the Zequinox? Uh, can Zequinox reduce the number of attached zebra mussels to those native mussels? Is there a significant change in the environment? So far that's been shown negative, but let's, let's study that anyway with this project. Can, in general, can it reduce the population of adult zebra mussels within an area of a lake under these conditions? And then lastly, are there any non-target organism impacts? So is, is, is algae shifting? Are the insects emerging differently? Um, Pre-application, one day after, seven days after, 30 days after, and also a year after. So a lot of time points were, went into checking for these non-target in, in questions. Today, I'd like to just focus on some preliminary results for these three middle questions. We are still currently processing data for the non-target organisms, just because there were so many groups of organisms that we looked at. And then this top part was mostly for the USGS data that they're still processing and going through their review process as well. <coughs> so our study design was what's called a paired design where we had two plots next to each other. <coughs> one was treated, one was not. And they were situated around different parts of the lake. So the red circles denote those are the ones treated with Zequinox. In terms of size, they're just under an acre. Total treatment area was around three acres. And then of course, I just numbered the plots that were treated and which ones were not. So as I alluded to earlier, we monitored water chemistry, the phytoplankton, so the, the plankton that's in the water column free floating. Some benthic algae species, so algae that's attached to the bottom. And then with both of those, we me measured chlorophyll A. Some physiochemical properties, so pH, the conductivity of the water, dissolved oxygen, and, and the turbidity. And then lastly, the emergent aquatic insects. <coughs> Was there a reason you just chose the shallow water? Was that just ease of? Um, for a couple of reasons, the application was easier in shallow water. We wanted it to settle down on the bottom. Since it's such a fine powder, we wanted it as soon as possible to go down. And then also that's where the mussels are, are most likely to be found. Yeah. Uh, so two images here are from the USGS. They also did zebra mussel quantification before and after application. They had these little, little containment samplers where they put a, a pile of zebra mussels in, a known number, before the treatment and after the treatment to see if you know if they would survive just in a natural sort of area. Um, and our, our main portion was the attachment to native mussels. And the USGS also did some glycogen analysis, which is a glucose analysis, some, which you might think of as, as blood sugar in your body um, for these mus native mussels. So the, what that would tell the researchers and from the USGS is are these muscles being stressed? Normally under stress, you are changing the number or the amount of glycogen in your system. So how do we survey? We had those plots set up, and here's an example of one plot. You had the corners marked. We had these transects lined end to end, and each of those yellow dots was where a quadrant was set down. We picked up all the native muscles within that area and counted the number of zebra muscles at which were attached. So you can see two, two people here, Matt and one of our, um, Troy Keller, our researchers, not only measuring the muscle itself, but counting the number of zebra muscles that are attached. Here's how we collected the insect emergence. So Bob Pillsbury was wonderful in engineering these, these piece of equipment that had some kid noodles with some PVC piping that floated. Had an anchor attached to it. You can see the rope coming down, so it would stay there. And as these insects come up out of the water, their first instinct is to fly, fly up. And so what they do is they come up and they kind of get stuck and then they fall down into this, this bottling system. So all, all Bob had to do was come out, unscrew the bottle cap, throw the insects in some ethanol and come back. 
And then lastly, we had a team doing all of our pH conductivity, the physiochemical. So there's a lot of moving parts in this project. And just wanted to highlight some of the different parts. And we were shooting for an optimal concentration of, of 100 milligrams per liter within the bottom 75 centimeters of the lake. So within the bottom three quarters of a meter, we wanted that whole area to be 100 milligrams per liter. And there's an overhead shot that's actually from the video in the beginning of the barge. And you can make out two of the corner markers right there. They're right next to each other. What was that piece of equipment? Is that USGS? That's the USGS, yeah. So here's some preliminary results of our Zequinox concentrations within the treatment plots. Um, again, our target was about 100. And as you can notice, we're a little low within the first hour post-application. And then by hour two, things start to drop off dramatically. And those three lines uh, indicate different areas within the plot. So the core is the very, very center of the plot. The fringe and the edge are right on the outside of the, towards the outside of the plots. The environmental treatments or environmental measurements, I should say, before and after. Same time periods, one hour, two hours, up to eight hours after. If you take a look at just the first two measurements, dissolved oxygen and pH, you might expect a slight decrease in dissolved oxygen because of the breakdown from the bacteria that you're putting into the water as, as organic materials in the water and it's being used up and broken down into nutrients. Organisms, other bacteria have to use oxygen for that to happen. Um, but as you'll notice, the, the decrease was very, very minimal even eight hours after application. Similarly, pH showed no major um, shifts. So you have plot one, 8.5 to 8.6. It's very, very stable. And then two of the other measurements from the physical and chemical stuff, conductivity and turbidity. As you might imagine, turbidity an hour after application, since it's a material in the water column, it's making it more turbid. You'd expect that to be quite high an hour after, but then recover very quickly eight hours later. What, why the big difference between the plots on the initial one hour? You've gone from 16, 37. That's a is great that, question. It's uh, that current? It could be due to some movement of the water column. Uh, although all the treatments were done under calm conditions before sunrise a lot of times, or at sunrise. Uh, the turbidity differences likely have to do with just the way it was applied, or the way it settled within the water column. So within Round Lake, we found three native mussels, known as a giant floater, the eastern pond mussel, which is actually a state endangered mussel, and the fat mucket. So these three species were surveyed before, seven days after, 30 days after, and also a year after. I haven't shown the year after because we're still processing those. But as you'll notice, the average zebra mussels that were attached in each of these time points uh, per mussel didn't change a whole lot if you were to round these up to a whole zebra mussel. You can't have really 0.1 zebra mussels. <laughs> so you have four or four, and I would still say four. Uh, the Zequinox treatment areas were slightly different, where we saw a small decrease seven days after, but not much of a difference 30 days after. So again, these are still preliminary, and we still like to compare in that design of, of a paired next to each other type scenario, where the one plot that was treated right next to the two that wasn't treated. We'd like to do more analysis comparing those two. But holistically, that's some preliminary results that we're seeing. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the record or one of the higher attachments was 49 per one muscle, which is quite high. OK. If, the, yeah. if that muscle, zebra muscle that died while it was attached, it wouldn't necessarily fall off anyway, would it? Um, that depends on how soon it had, had, had died. Eventually it would likely get knocked off or right. have come off because the bissel threads would deteriorate, deteriorate and, 
and come up. But by you're then, the, the native muscles probably did too. By that time, there's a chance that the native muscle, yeah, could have, mm. could have died. Okay, zebra muscle densities. This is a little more interesting where we just look at zebra muscles in the plots themselves, not attached to a native muscle. And we do see a little bit of a decrease in the treatment areas. So per meter squared, before treatment we saw 124 in this one plot and was 65 muscles lower or fewer 30 days after the treatment. So there's some positive news there. Do you have an idea why the attached ones did not suffer in these zoo? I don't. We don't know yet. Um, yeah. Because if I'm in the substrate, <clears throat> it seems to me that seems, seems these things attach mainly to to hard subject mm -hmm. hard substrate uh, <coughs> control and the sub and the um, test area. Was that substrate pretty similar? Yes. So uh, this is again holistically over all of our plots. What okay. I really like to do is compare so it's consistent right next to each other. Yeah. Okay. I remember right, zebra mussels only attached to something like a rock or another clam. Mm -hmm. So they're, they have to be attached to something. Yes. But, but if they're attached, a big bunch of around a like clam, apparently they're not affected much. But they can attach to themselves, yeah. They create clumps. Yeah. What might look like a rock is actually a group of, a clump of 50 or 100 zebra mussels <coughs> attached to each other. So, yeah. So those are some very preliminary results and it kind of wraps up a brief synopsis of the project. Some of the quick conclusions here is that our target concentration was a little bit lower than expected and it reduced, it was reduced fairly rapidly uh, two hours after the application. Uh, we didn't see much of a reduction in densities attached to the native muscles. Uh, we certainly and thankfully did not see a significant environmental change from those main parameters. What we'd like to do is, is think about adjusting some of the application. So it was a barge that had uh, a benthic application to it. It'd be nice to have something <clears throat> such as a slow release pellet that comes down and sinks to the bottom and then there's a slow release dissolving for the muscles to and then ingest. That might be a, a more worthwhile or a more efficient application. And then also the, the idea of using continued usage of baffle and semi-permeable barriers around different areas of the lake. So if you have a lake system that has hot spots of these populations of zebra mussels, perhaps we could take the ideas from Minnesota and adapt them to some of, some of our lakes. That might be a more efficient application as well. And then I mentioned the pellet-based solution. Do they have a greater kill in Minnesota than you did then? Um, yes. They did. Uh, I don't know the exact difference, but I know they were higher. Another component of the project was our education and outreach. So we actually reached out to multiple high schools in the area, and Maria and Eli here at the Watershed Council were able to, to work with over 150 local high school students in the water of Round Lake and in the classroom teaching them what native muscles are present here in Michigan. So that was also a nice, nice component of the, of the, of the work. And as you can see, there are a number of partners that we need to thank. UMBS especially for their usage of facilities and housing for all of our researchers. Um, the EPA, of course, for their support and the funding of the project. The Marone Bio Innovations for the product. LTC for their support and because they own a lot of area around Brown Lake. USGS for all their application and their partnership. We had a lot of contact with the MSU Extension, MNFI. They were the actual identifiers for a lot of our muscles. Um, Dr. Paul Moore from DGSU helped us doing the one-year post-survey using scuba equipment. And then Rich, who's here today with us, and many other Round Lake residents who let us store equipment around their, their shoreline. So thank you very much. So I hope that was a worthwhile endeavor, and if there's any questions, I would be more than happy to help answer them. Well, I know the answer to the question, but just for information, sure. the reason you chose Round Lake 
was because there a lot of people said zebra mussels in Crooked Lake and Burt right. Lake, but you couldn't find native mussels there. Correct. We needed to have a healthy population of native mussels okay. in these lakes to have uh, an answer for, for this type of work. Is that a reflection of later invasion? It could be. It could be. Because there's not, I mean, are there other factors in that lake that might let them hang on? It could be a habitat type situation, mm -hmm. sediment. The native mussels like to bury in the sediment, so there's not much of soft sediment in those lakes. But later invasions could be why we chill as Round Lake, too. Were all the tests done in open water areas? They were. No barriers. The only uh, items delineating those plots were flags on the corners. So it was a completely open environment and the, the application barge drove up and down that plot as it applied. As I know we've seen a lot on weeds, small, real small zebra mussels, mm -hmm. and there could be 20 on one stem. And I wonder if you put that equin equinox in a weeded area, if it wouldn't suspend more instead of... It, Perhaps, so yeah, you're suggesting maybe the water movements would be lower yeah, and, or it would settle out. Settle on the, on the plant itself. It could. You know, I don't know. That's a good question that that's more, requires more follow-up work from what we did, yeah. Is Maroon working toward uh, time release pellets? They'd like to. They, they've expressed interest in that idea. Uh, I think they are more... They're, they're more interested in some of the industrial applications. Mm -hmm. That's where it was started. That's sort of the, the genesis of, of the product. So so it is good to use your power plants and stuff like that. They do use it, huh? They do, correct, yep. I think that's Bangor is Maine, not Michigan, isn't it? Where the, where the show where it comes from Bangor. And it says M-I, that's Michigan. I think it's M-E, because it's a Bangor, Maine. Uh, mm -hmm. I just have to look it up. Yeah. Anybody know where? Is it the Bangor, Michigan, anywhere? I thought it was Southeastern. I thought it was Southeastern. Yeah. Yeah. That's around Bay City somewhere, yeah. isn't it? Find this out. Is really Zequinox on the open market to be purchased, or does it? Is it still in a research? It's still in the, in the research, uh, restoration, I, did, um, I guess, category. And then the industrial for intake pipes and power plants. Yep. It's in Van Buren County. Van Buren County. In Michigan. How do they plant in an industrial setting? I mean, there's right. pipes there, there's water flow going through there. It seems like it's pretty tough to... Yeah, reach. well, my understanding is they know the pipe diameter so they can calculate how much water is coming through and create the concentrations that way. Okay. Put Zequinax in, let it sit well, for a certain period of time, yeah. and then flush it out. Okay. That's my understanding. All wrong. Grand Haven. Grand Haven. Grand Haven. Oh, there you go. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you.